Welcome to the podcast where we dive deep into the fascinating world of literature and storytelling. Today, we have an incredible honor and an incredible guest. He also has a podcast on our uh, podcast community, and his name is Dan Hendrickson, and he is an author of a series of books, and he is a, just a captivating uh, storyteller. He is none other than the acclaimed author whose imagination knows no bounds. With a pen that weaves the talent of wonder and characters that leap off the pages of our guests, that he has enchanted readers worldwide with his books and his creations. His ability to transport us to vibrant, vivid worlds of unparalleled as he effortlessly takes us on an extraordinary journey filled with suspense, emotion, profound, profound wisdom, and many more things. Throughout his illust illust his allurous career, he has penned numerous best-selling novels that have captured the hearts of readers across all genes. From gripping thrillers to immersed fantasy realms, his versatility as an author is truly inspiring. And today we have him on the show, and he's going to talk about one of his latest books, The Legend of Deputy Jim. And so it's an honor to have you back on the show. I'm very excited to have you. And, you know, so tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do so they have a little idea of your little background information. Well, thanks, Stacey. It's great to be back. And wow, what an intro. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, like you said, my name's Dan Hendrickson. Um, I grew up in Sheridan, Wyoming, back in the 60s and the 70s. And I've been living in Pennsylvania for the last 25 years. I'm a small business owner. I own a uh, body shop and a detail shop and an auto dealership over near the Mannheim Auto Auction in Mannheim, Pennsylvania. My wife and I have been running that business for about 25 years. And uh, we have three children. Uh, they're all grown. I have two grandchildren and another grandkid on the way, which mm -hmm. is really exciting. Yes. And uh, I love storytelling. I love writing books. My dad was, a, uh, was an English professor at the University of Wyoming. And he liked to write plays and uh, po did poetry and stuff. And he got published and he kind of instilled in me a, a love for that. I went and uh, earned my degree in journalism from an offshoot of, uh, uh, it's called Casper College. It was an offshoot of University of Wyoming. And that's where I got into uh, writing. And I found that I had a more of a love for writing stories and stuff instead of just writing you know, about news. Right. And so I've just been messing around with it really heavily now for about the last six years. Uh, the book that I want to talk about today is The Legend of Deputy Jim. If it's, it's an offshoot of my uh, Last Enemy series, it's a prequel to those books. And it's about my hometown because I grew up in Sheridan, Wyoming back in the 60s and the 70s. And uh, one of the things that we dealt with back then was the uh, rampaging biker gangs that were going all throughout the Northwest, selling drugs and, and smuggling and causing all kinds of problems. And as a kid back then, you were pretty scared of those guys. And one of the things that we really looked to one of the groups of people we really looked to to protect us was law enforcement, the sheriff's departments, the police departments, the highway patrol, stuff like that. We really looked to those guys to protect us from those gangs because there was a lot of stuff. We, you know, we were small towns up there, and but we got a, a, a glimpse of big city type crime whenever those guys had come through rapes and murders and bank robberies and you name it, it was happening. So that's part of the book on uh, the legend of Deputy Jim. So that's a little bit about me. Mm -hmm. Now, how did and you go the about the, the research of it? Like, did, was it basically stories and things that actually happened? Or did you go deep down into into uh, finding more research about more about the gangs and what actually occurred and things behind the scenes that maybe weren't talked about in your town? Well, one of the things that uh, I saw was why the uh, the drug cartels back down south basically use these gangs to smuggle and process their drugs up in the northern states. And you think about Wyoming, Montana, and even uh, the Rocky Mountain parts of Colorado, it's really easy for for gangs to go up and hide in the mountains and stuff and and to take the raw materials they got from the uh, cartels down south and bring them up and process them. And they, you know, they had meth labs and other things. 
And these guys would smuggle all these drugs on their bikes, which was, you know, and by today, you think it's a little ridiculous because it's got these, you know, these um, Harley motorcycles, yeah. which are big bikes, but they really don't have, you know, big storage compartments. Right. But if you got a gang of like about 50 bikers going down the road, then you can hide a lot of drugs with those guys. And, uh, you know, by the most part, uh, I, don't want, I don't want to say that the cops left them alone, but they were intimidating. And if the and if the uh, and if the law enforcement didn't have a lot of backup with them, they wouldn't be stopping these guys and searching their bikes. Like if if they ever wanted to go in and um, mess around with some of these guys, it, it it would take more than two or three squad cars. They couldn't just go by themselves. So they would just travel from like you know the the border of Mexico all the way up into Wyoming and Montana, and then they'd take their drugs up into their uh, their labs where they'd cook them and and get them all processed and then start distributing them out. And that was part of the research that I uh, saw. Now, I knew that this stuff was going on when I was a kid. I just didn't understand what they were doing Yeah. Uh, so much after I started the research. But the book progressed from um, some characters in my, uh, in my books, The Last Enemy. And the guy, Deputy Jim, is actually the grandfather of my main character in my first book, The Good Fight. And her name is Danielle Edwards. And her dad was uh, Commander Jacob Edwards, which was also a main character in my books. Well, Jim is Jacob's dad and Daniel's grandfather. And uh, so there was a scene in uh, my last book, The Last Enemy, where Jacob was talking to his dad um, about some horrible things that had happened early on in his career when he was a Coast Guard officer and how it mentally and emotionally affected him. And his dad told him a secret about why he had to leave Wyoming when he was when Jacob was very young. And he said that he uh, he had to confront uh, a biker gang pretty much all by himself wow. with a couple of shotguns. And he had to, you know, it was it was like a war. Yeah. And he uh, back then he had a really bad temper. And uh, when they threatened his wife and his kid, he just went kind of berserk and took most of the gang out. And then his uh, boss, Lieutenant Al Freeberger of the Sheridan County Sheriff's Department, told him that he needed to find another line of work because he just couldn't stay in that line of work after what he did. So that's when he left. And that little scene got a lot of um, attention from people. And they're like, wow, you know, we didn't know that Jim did this. And, you know, that's pretty cool. And so it all started developing into my first prequel. Yeah where I wanted to show Jim's backstory. And, you know, Jim grew up in my hometown. He's a fictional character, obviously, but, you know, I had him growing up in my hometown, went to my high school. And uh, he had decided that he uh, wasn't going to go in the military like a lot of his family did, but he still wanted to serve his country. But he had already married his high school sweetheart, so he didn't want to leave her. So he, he decided to join the sheriff's department. And so he went to Casper Community College, which is right, I mean, not like Casper, but Sheridan Community College, which is right there in my hometown. And he yeah. studied um, law enforcement. And he got a two-year degree in that. And the sheriff um, hired him on as, as a deputy. And he turned out to be a pretty good deputy. In fact, in the book, I have him kind of being as smart as a Dick Tracy and being able to figure out crimes and stuff. And everybody yeah. really liked him. And he was really good at his job. And there's a couple quirky things I put in there, like uh, all the guys back then carried uh, like the Taurus 357 wheel guns, and they didn't carry automatics until later on in the late 70s, early 80s. And they were all pretty good with those guns, you know, being in a kind of a cowboy area. But yeah. Jim wasn't that great with a pistol. He was uh, left eye dominant, means wow. that when he aimed, he had to use his left eye to center out a shot and when i was in law enforcement i also was left eye dominant and i had to work twice as hard as the other guys to become a decent shot um, to qualify right like every month we had to go for qualification so that i put that into jim but i gave him a little bit of strength and he was he was like superb with a shotgun he was really really good with a shotgun and so that was his weapon of choice when he was confronted. And then throughout the book, you'll see different scenes where he has to use his shotgun to protect himself and to protect the people he loves. And uh, yeah, so that's a lot about the crime of the book. And there were some other cool things in there. Like uh, I show in the, it's Kendrick Park. 
in Sheridan, Wyoming, and they used to have a little teeny zoo there and where they had some bear and some deer and stuff that people would go see. Well, after about 1969, 1970, they um, decided they didn't want to uh, do that park anymore, so they took out the cages. They took out the cages, but they left the caves. Now, you know, any you think about that today and it'd be like a, a, a recipe for disaster with kids. Yeah. But in the park, you got these caves that the bears lived in or the deer lived in. And you can crawl in there and, and goof around. And a bunch of us kids did. <laughs> and so um, part of the, the, the fun part of the book or fun or, you know, the drama of the book was that some high school kids were in there and they were they were smoking some reefer and they get attacked by this uh, this bike game right there in Kendrick Park late at night when it was supposed to be closed down. So I just got to add little simple details like that. And that was one of the fun things about writing a book that centered around my hometown is I just have all this stuff in my memory. It's almost like in my DNA. Oh yeah. I remember this and shared. And I remember that and shared. I remember we used to do this and that, you know, and it was really easy to write it. Um, you know, going to the mountains and story Wyoming, which is about 28 miles South of Sheridan, but it's up in the mountains. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, that's where a lot of the biker gangs went and cooked their their meth out in the mountains right behind. The, they got this, uh, I think it's called the Little Goose uh, Canyon that they went into. And they would they would hide out in there in their little camps and they would cook their meth. Well, that's where I had my biker gang, which was called the Wolf, the Wild Wolves. They uh, snuck up there into the mountains and they, they cooked their meth. And then Jim went up there on horseback hunting them. Mm. So... That was pretty cool. It seems like you have a lot of fiction, but yet you have a, a lot of it's based on history too. What you can remember growing up as a child and all the things that, that you experienced while growing up. It seems a lot of that has really centered around the book. So is it, mm -hmm. is, is there a lot of fiction in here or is it, is it the story you kind of fabricated it to be a little bit more juicier or. Well, I definitely juiced it up a lot. I know that the, um, my brother-in-law, who was a uh, who was a highway patrolman back during those days, now he told me a lot of stories about uh, the biker gangs and stuff like that. And he he told me the stories about how they would set up the uh, the communication. I don't know if you know what a uh, party line is, but back in the seventies, uh, people were on party lines in their in, on their telephones, setting sixties. That means that several people shared the same line you did. Like you yeah. could pick up your phone, you could hear your neighbor in a conversation with their right. friend, and then you'd have to hang up and wait till they're done before the line's free, then you could use it. Yes. Well, uh, up there in, in story, one of the methods they have was that, you know, you would, uh, how many rings went off the phone would tell you what was going on. Like two rings, the highway patroller in town, three rings, the sheriff's department is in town, you know, uh, four rings, all of them are in town. You know, the way these guys would, because they didn't want anybody listening to their telephone conversation. So these guys knew not to pick up the phone and that right. would be their signal. And Joe Arzi, he was my uh, brother-in-law. He told me that it took them a long time to figure out these signals. To It's because every time they'd go up there, everybody just scattered and they couldn't find any of the biker gangs because wow. they were all signals. Yeah. So that that's history. But then the story that I put together with Deputy Jim is fiction. You know, it's a lot of fiction, but there's a, there's a lot of stuff in there that is just did actually did happen. I mean, basically, it's a biker gang comes to town. Um wants to uh, enhance and, and start picking up speed with their with their meth development and all that and their drug smuggling. And they run head into Deputy Jim, who stands up against him. And Deputy Jim's got this really beautiful wife, and her name is Linda. And one of the biker gang guys that's one of the head of the biker gangs gets attracted to her and wants to take her away from him. And so they kind of buck heads, and yeah. uh, Jim beats the tar out of him. <laughs> <laughs> And so that gets the whole gang after him. They want to kill him because he embarrassed the whole gang. And uh, so his uh, another very colorful character in the book is a guy named Al Freeberger. And he's the lieutenant under the Sheriff Manning. Okay. And I had him as an ex-Marine um, Sergeant Major. And he is uh, fashioned after my stepfather, who was also an ex-Marine sergeant who served in um, World War II, Vietnam, and Korea. So he was like kind of a lifer in the military. Yeah. And so Al 
was the expert gunfighter um but and all kinds of you know that and he was he was also a sergeant major in the um national guard which had a big huge depot right there in sheridan and so i had him having all that resources and so when all hell breaks loose and and the gangs try to you know wipe out the sheriff's department shared in wyoming um al's able to get the national guard involved to confront him right down in the town while jim is fighting him up at story wyoming oh wow i don't want to give away too much of the story but you know that's part of what's going on and, and uh, jim does prevail you know he's it's the legend of deputy jim uh, one of the nice things about the story is I have three areas of the story where it comes back to modern times where uh, somebody's telling the story to uh, some of Jim's family. You got Daniel there. You got uh -huh. Jacob there. You got their grandchildren there and and some other people that are, didn't know why Jim had to leave Sheridan all those years ago. And yeah. so it's in a bar called the Rainbow Bar, which is a, a famous bar in Sheridan. Um, everybody knows about the Rainbow Bar and everybody knows about the Mint Bars, two of the big bars in Sheridan where all the cowboys go. And so I had him in the Rainbow Bar. And my cousin, a um, guy named William Arzy, um, used to manage that place years ago. So I'm pretty familiar with that. And everybody used to go there, play darts and, and hang out. And they had food and stuff. And it was it was a nice cowboy bar that everybody went to. So I had Jim and his family there listening to this highway patrolman guy tell the story about what Jim did he left shared and it was the first time it was revealed to everybody in the book what what he did and how, why he had to leave and stuff it, it seems like deputy jim and also even the lieutenant they're they're strong gentlemen but they actually have a big heart as well it seems yeah yeah and it's it's a, it was it was al freeberger that kind of like uh he, he's the one that, that taught Jim how to be a sheriff deputy. And he also recognized that Jim had a problem with his temper. And that was kind of a theme through some of my books is that, you know, there's a, a, a thing called being a berserker. A berserker, like in the old Viking days, they, 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 a berserker was someone who lost his mind and went into went into battle just with no sense of self-preservation, just giving himself 100% going after his enemy. And it's kind of a mental deficiency brought on by trauma or whatever. You know, sometimes right. it was drug induced. But, uh, you know, Jim and his family had that off and on, you know, genetically where they would right. they, they could potentially be berserkers. And, and Al, having been in war so much in, you know, World War Two and Nam had seen it before with guys. And yeah. he knew what it meant. And he knew that, you know, this guy doesn't need to be in law enforcement. He doesn't need to be, you know, in the military. He needs to go find something else to do. Right. Because um, and so that's why Jim later on in, in the books, the first three books is he owns an automobile dealership and wholesaling operation in Mannheim. That's what he went to. Right. So he went away. He walked away from law enforcement because uh, Al told him to. And so he did. At the end of the book, you'll see the whole thing where they have a long talk and they say, you need to get out of this. And I'm going to help you get in. He had Al had friends all over the country. So he got him set up in Alabama where he worked for a guy for a while. And then a guy was a dealership owner who sent him up to Pennsylvania and got him set up with the auction. Oh, wow. And then that that leads into my first three books, which you talked we talked about on the one of our, the podcasts, yes. uh, the Last Enemy series. Yeah, we talked about that whole thing. So Jim's the granddad, and uh, so actually in those books he has to revisit some of his old rage because he has to rescue, help rescue his granddaughter, help rescue his son, and fight off all these bad guys. And he was at seventy years old, but he still got it. <laughs> wow, I'd like to be in your head when you're dreaming. <laughs> It sounds like adventure. a great adventure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wow. Now, where can people find this book? Well, they can find it on Amazon. Um, it's in, um, you know, it's physical. It, it's, uh, you know, you can get it hardback, softbound, or um, digital with Kindle. Or you can find it also on Barnes & Noble. Same thing. And uh, we're looking to get it done with the uh, audio book here. I do have three of my books out in audio right now, and that might be the fourth. We'll see. But, okay. uh, yeah, so that's there. And, uh, 
Uh, did I mention it has a silver medal with with uh, no you didn't with reader's mention favorite that. yeah it's it's a silver medal winner of nine of uh, twenty twenty one um, so that was really cool that it won that and it's gotten a lot of great reviews over the years and stuff and I've gotten a lot of great comments and uh, one reviewer compared it to a Louis L'Amour book which you know I was very humbled by that that was yeah. pretty cool because I love Louis L'Amour and. <laughs> Yeah, so that's pretty much uh, a lot about Deputy Jim. Now, can you give us a sneak peek into the future? Because I know you have some things planned, some projects and some books planned for the for the future. Can you give us like a little like, bit of a snippet of what's going sure. on in the future? By the most part, most of my books are following the Edwards line. Um, in fact, I, I don't know if people figured it out. Some have. But even my, my most popular book, which is Brandy Ballad of a Pirate Princess, um, shows like the beginning of the Edward line because, you know, it's Captain John Edwards and he marries Brandy, the pirate princess, and they start the whole clan. Uh, so we're, you know, and I, in a lot of my, most of my books are, are following that bloodline. So the very next book that I got coming out is um, Brandy, and this is a working title, but we're thinking uh, either Guardian of Honor or Defender of Honor. Now, Brandy uh, was trained by a Shaolin priest in martial arts while she was in hiding in Jamaica uh, from being caught. You know, there were people trying to kill her because of her. Her mom and dad were notorious pirates. And so she she earned a uh, couple of swords called master swords from him. And he uh, he he was a part of a Shaolin um, order that sought out and trained talented girls in the uh, martial arts and, and being warriors. And he trained Brandy. So uh, in the first book, he awarded her to master swords and she used them to go rescue John Edwards and, and, and some other people that were captured by some pirates. And she also, you know, she, she sailed a ship in there and all that. But in the second book, um, the master swords really come into play because uh, her, trainer her sifu her teacher zhang yang um had some uh a difficulty in his early life that he had to go correct in china and so he had to leave jamaica to go back and and correct a mistake he made and the mistake was he trained the wrong person and he had to go take care of this person well according to the way you know the whole martial arts uh, shaolin order worked was yeah. that he couldn't do it himself directly it had to be somebody he trained okay. to regain his honor but he didn't he loved brandy and he loved the whole family and so he really didn't want to have to get her involved with that but throughout the book you'll see how situations just compile and she has to go defend his honor she has to go take care of this mistake he made. And uh, in, in the book, she does. And and so that's one's coming out, probably April, May, maybe June at the latest. Oh, very and, cool. Uh, then after that, I'm working on one called The Railroad Man. And um, Deputy Jim's dad was a railroad guy. And in that book, I say that the whole Edwards family had a long tradition of railroad in their family. And so I thought, well, how can I how can I uh, tie this in with the Edwards family? So what I have is Brandy and John's son, Arthur, going into the Navy during the Civil War. And after the Civil War is over, he joins the railroad and he gets transferred to Wyoming. Wow. And so, you know, so you're going to have uh, him there and he's going to meet and fall in love with a uh, Indian princess and he's going to have to save her and all that kind of stuff. And so I'm still working on that book, but that's, that's how I'm getting the Edwards into Wyoming. Oh, very cool. This sounds very exciting. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's, I think it's going to be really fun for people to read this book. It's, it's, it's going to be a total Western, you know, Kirkus calls deputy Jim, a Neo Western, which means more modern Western, but this one's going to be a true Western because it's going to be right around 1878, 1879. Oh, very when, cool. Uh, really when the big cattle, uh, 
movement happened in Wyoming where they were, you know, the, the big cattle ranches opened up all over the place and, and the train, the railroad was going straight up through Wyoming into Montana, all the way up to Billings. And they were able to ship cattle from there to Chicago or, or uh, San Francisco, wherever you wanted to go. So just a nice little, uh, background of the railroad in there and my grandpa was a railroad man both my grandpas were railroad men so they're both conductors oh, wow. you know, one worked out of montana the other one worked out of uh out of sheridan wyoming oh wow so that's part of my background with the railroad guys that's very cool now when it comes you know before we go i just wanted to see if you can give a couple of takeaways for people um that really are interested in storytelling you know, do you have any suggestions for people who really have a love for storytelling? They just don't know where to begin, or they just don't know how to put it on paper, some maybe suggestions on how they can maybe take their stories that they have, like you did, and bring them to life in, in a book. Really, you know, it just depends on what kind of person they are. Now, if they're a real, like, you know, technical, everything by the book, a planner, Mm -hmm. You know, someone who has to have everything laid out, I would say make an outline. Mm -hmm. Now, outlines, really detailed outlines don't work for me. I got I, I need a basic outline, but I can't work with a real detailed one. Right. Does, I feel like I, I'm too confined. But I know people that are like that. And they just, you know, they, they need an outline and then they can f like take baby steps and fill out the story. Yeah. Um, other people that, you know, just kind of like to blast it, I say just start writing. Yeah. And don't worry about it. Don't worry about your grammar. Don't worry about your spelling. Don't worry about any of that stuff. Just get started. You know, right. uh, the funnest part of writing a book is the first draft. Mm -hmm. That's the funnest part. That's you telling the story to yourself. Yeah. And really, honestly, that's that's the most enjoyable part of writing for me. The work is the second, third, fourth draft, you know, correcting all your grammatical mistakes, uh, uh, getting the format properly, all that stuff, revisions, putting some more in, taking some stuff out. Uh, and you get, there's, there's editors and stuff that can help you. And for God's sakes, don't ever think that you can ever write a book without an editor. <laughs> And I know people that think they are. I think I, I've talked to people with English degrees and stuff like, that. Oh, I don't need an editor. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you do. Yeah, you do. You need an editor. You, sometimes you need more than one. That's very you know, true. Use editors, use proofreaders, um, use people to just read your story and give you comments and stuff. Everybody needs other eyes on their story. hundred percent. And it's really a, you're the, you're the writer. So you get to, you get to make and you get to imagine the whole story together. But after that, you just need some help. Like, what about putting chapters together? What about putting chapter headings? All this stuff? You need help. Yeah. So and maybe that's part of the daunting part of getting started. Oh, I don't know how to do all that. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm trying to uh, put a query letter for this uh, this latest book, Brandy, Defender of Honor. I tell you, man, sometimes it can be a little daunting just trying to uh, think, what am I going to say to this agent to yeah. get him hooked or get him interested in this particular book? And uh, get help. There's people to help you. You know, right. my editor told me he'll look at whatever I, I write and, and he'll give me some suggestions. So great. You know, as soon as I get it written, I'm going to send it to him. He's going to give me some suggestions and I'll probably send it to somebody else that, that works with queries, you know, right. just, uh, but don't ever be, don't stop because you just don't feel like you can do it. Just right. get, get something written down. Just mm -hmm. start writing. If you have to put a schedule together, an outline, a format, do it. Right. But if you don't work like that, just start writing. And just enjoy it. You know, first, my first book, my wife told me was one like was uh, sixty eight thousand words of one paragraph. Obviously, <laughs> it wasn't just one paragraph, but you know, I just wrote. Yeah, I just wrote it. And I had my daughter help me edit it, and I had somebody else help me edit it, and I went through about four or five edits before it even we even started thinking about putting it in a print. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So editing is a big deal. Yeah, it is a big deal. It's a uh, doesn't matter what level of education you have, it, you know, it's always good to have other people because they they pick out things that you wouldn't even see because, you know, you need a second eye. You definitely do. No, 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 no author, no published author out there has anything that's out there that hasn't been edited. I'll guarantee it. Right. You know, I mean, if somebody self published something and they didn't let anybody else edit it. 
you know, I, unless they're like an Einstein or something, I mean, they're, they're going to get crucified. Yeah. <laughs> people just pick out mistakes and typos and, 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 uh, you know, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. yeah. And I just, I would never do that. Like, right. Yeah, I, I go through probably six, six, six edits from beginning to end yeah. before I even think about sending it on to a query or self-publishing it. Right. And it's, a, it, it's, you know, and that's, that's something else you got to think through if you want to be a writer and you want to be a published writer that uh, you're going to need that. And some, that will cost a little bit of money. There are people that, you know, you can have friends that can do it, have degrees that can help you. Maybe they maybe once in a while, somebody will do it for free. I know my daughter did it for free. I mean, <laughs> it was a, it was a Christmas present, but it was a lot of work for her. Yeah. And you know, I mean, there are places you can go on the internet and, and find out how much editors cost and right. good ones and, and reputable ones and stuff like that. So that's something to consider when you get into writing too. Well, that's excellent advice. I, you know, I think people, and, and it also gives people inspiration that they can do it also, you know, it's, it's anyone can do it if they really have a passion to do it. It's just going to be a lot of hard work and it's, and it's going to take time, but if you really yeah. have a passion I think, you know, anyone can, can put their thoughts on paper and you can just get help, you know, getting it to that, that point where it's actually printable, you know, mm-hmm. definitely. There, are, there is software out there that can help you edit. Yeah. I use it. It's not perfect. And I don't think it'll ever be perfect. And I'm not talking about AI, something writing your story for you. I'm talking right. about software that'll help you spell your words properly, help you put the commas and the periods and the semicolons and all that in the right spot. Right. Um, will help you formulate better paragraphs. There is software out there. Yeah. But it, that also costs money. Right. Know, but it's worth it. To me, it's worth it. No, I agree. A hundred percent. I agree. And where can everybody find your website if they want to go on your website? It's um it's Dan E Hendrickson.com, all lowercase, just my name, Dan, then E, then Hendrickson, H-E-N-D-R-I-C-K-S-O-N.com. And all my books are on there. Any kind of awards that they have won over the years are on there. All the really important reviews are on there. Um, all the podcasts that I've done of myself and with other people, like everything we've done together is on yes. there. Um so you know, if you want to find out about my books, that's the best place to go. And you can also order my books off of that website. I'll, if you want autographed copies, you know, I'll sell them to you and I'll send them to you. Otherwise, I got links to Barnes and Noble and Amazon right there. You can just go from there and just buy them. That sounds amazing. And are you on the social networks also? Can they find you on social oh, yeah. networks? I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook. Uh, I'm on uh, Twitter. What are they calling it now? <laughs> yes. yeah. i still go by twitter I, I, I... Yeah, twitter. <laughs> and uh you know i'm all i'm all on most of them you know the newer ones i don't know maybe they're, they they keep coming up with more but alignable and some other ones i forget but yeah i'm on at least the the big four major ones That's and it's just you can look up my name just my i keep everything real simple it's just my name and look it up and you can find me i got an author's page that's pretty popular on on um Facebook, they get a lot of, uh, I get a lot of um, traffic there. Great. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, this has been amazing. I, I thank you so much for coming on the show and, and sharing your new book with us. It's very Thanks. exciting. I, I I definitely want to read it. It sounds very exciting. And the fact that you actually lived through a lot of this, you know, that you, you know, you juiced it up and you, you know, made it into this, you know, fiction book, but yet you've experienced a lot of it. And the same thing with a lot of your other books, you know, you put a lot of either history in a lot of your books, or you have stories that, you know, that you, you've experienced. So it it makes it even really uh, more excitable because when you're reading it, it's a fiction book, but yet, you know, as you're reading it, these, some of these things actually did happen, you know? And uh, so it's, it's kind of exciting in a sense. And the book is dedicated to my brother-in-law, the one I told you about earlier, Joe Arzi, and he was a uh, um, highway patrolman in Sheridan for almost 40 years. Wow. And I don't know, it, probably everybody's heard of Longmire, mm-hmm. okay, the, the TV series. He was one of the guys that the original author went and interviewed about law enforcement in Wyoming. Wow. And and Joe lives right there in, um, he Joe 
passed away a few years ago, but Joe lived right there in Buffalo, Wyoming, where the Longmire series was filmed. Oh, wow. And Buffalo's like about 35 miles south of Sheridan. So I'm very familiar with that area too. Oh, that's so cool. So that was fun. Yeah, very fun. Oh my goodness. Well, this has been great, Dan. It's always a pleasure to have you on. And I love hearing your stories and your books. And uh, you're just an amazing gentleman. And thank you so much for the good advice, because there's so many people out there that, you know, want to write. And the power of storytelling is is, is so, it, it's, 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 it's so amazing. And, and people love stories. So it, it's, it's, uh, you know, to be able to put those 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 words on paper is is amazing. And it's a talent. But, you know, if someone really wants to do it, they can, you know. And thank you for your advice. You bet. Thank you, Jay. Stacey, it's great being here with you. Oh, it's, it's wonderful being with you, too. Thank you so much for being on the show. And I look forward to you coming back. And remember, everybody, Dan has his own podcast series on our show. And he has his own URL. And he has a whole list of his different podcasts that he's done so far with us. So you can go back and you can listen to all his previous podcasts with us. So thank you so much, Dan. This has been wonderful.